Good morning. You guys can have a seat and uh, welcome to worship. My name is Ben Barlow. It's my privilege to get to be your pastor uh, here at the well. And uh, thank you all for joining the band today as we kind of go unplugged or I guess it's really acoustic. Does that sound right? I don't know. It sounds fun. And thank you all for participating with your singing. Uh, it's a great day, and uh, I am so glad to see you. Uh, how many of you children, students, uh, are excited that school is almost out? How many of you parents are excited that school is almost out? Wah, wah. Yeah, yeah, I got you, I got you. Well, don't worry. First of all, congratulations to all our Long Beach graduates who uh, finished up this week. Yeah. Very exciting, and uh, I saw you, but you didn't see me, and so anyways, I was there cheering you on, and we will continue to cheer you on in your days, weeks, months, years ahead. Um, look, we got a couple of announcements as we head not only into the summer, but into this week ahead of us. Uh, first is Vacation Bible School is coming, and it's coming quickly. Uh, this year, we are having Vacation Bible School uh, during uh, the month of June, and you can find out some information inside your bulletin on that. Um, tonight at 5 o'clock, tonight, 5 o'clock, or I guess that's this late afternoon, at 5 o'clock at our main campus, 208 Pine Street, right behind Sonic. We are having a volunteer dinner. Now, this is for everyone who has signed up to volunteer for Vacation Bible School. And those of you who have not yet, but you're interested, come. We will find a spot for you, talk with you about what that might look like. But if you are signed up, this is, uh, we don't like to use the term mandatory, but we will find you. Uh, and so, <laughs> kidding, sort of. Um, anyways, 5 o'clock, uh, we will go over, kind of re just remind ourselves the mission and vision of why we do what we do. Uh, we will go over sort of the details of the different areas and responsibilities of, of sort of the different uh, volunteer positions. And uh, we'll eat some good food. Uh, you might play a game. You might hear a Bible story. Uh, anyways, it's going to be a lot of fun. And we also just want to celebrate you and say thank you for the, the time that you carve out for this week. So uh, for all volunteers, that goes for uh, everyone who has signed up to volunteer or if you're interested, come see us. Five o'clock at our main campus, that is today. Also, also, a couple other things, and then I promise we're done. There will be no youth group per se tonight. Rather, the students who are volunteering, all of those, right? Yeah, are going to come to the, to, the, to the volunteer dinner. So that's at five o'clock. Um, and so just so you don't feel like you're missing out on anything by coming to the volunteer dinner, you get to have youth group on Friday night at the Shuckers game. So our students are taking, oh, he's like, very exciting. Uh, our youth group is headed to the Shuckers on Friday, and uh, Hannah Halsey, sitting right back over here, will meet you at the Next Steps table after the service if you're interested in getting tickets. We have to pre-order those, so if you are a student, uh, we want to make sure that we get your name and number information. So if you, not your actual phone number, but the number of people that are coming, uh, please see Hannah at our Next Steps table in the round lobby out here on your way out, and we'll make sure you get that, or you can see me, call the office, whatever you want to do. Anyways, make sure you do that. It's going to be lots and lots of fun. Also, I have in my hand, if you were here last week, you remember me talking about, we have these door hangers. Our prayer ministry has put these together. Um, there, it's a prayer. You can go and visit your neighbors. If you've got folks you've been praying for, you can go uh, give the, you can take a door hanger, hang it on their door, pray for them. Uh, there's a prayer on here they can use if they're interested in it, but you can pick these up. There's like five in a bag. Uh, there's also some instructions on how you can pray for your neighbor, how you can reach out. I'd love for you to grab these on the way out. They are on the round table in the lobby uh, just outside the doors here. So you can grab those on the way out, and Charlene will be there uh, handing those out. She'll be glad to talk with you about what these are for, what you can do with those. Also, Wednesday is our older adults luncheon. Don't forget about that. If you're a senior adult, we'd love for you to join us for lunch at our main campus, and that is this Wednesday get there, I think, probably like 1130. I don't actually know the real time. I just show up when I smell the food. But anyways, uh, that is this Wednesday. Oaks is Wednesday. So lots of things happening in the life of the church. We are moving forward into the summer. I'm super excited about it. We've got one more week of our Paradox series after today. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the paradox of boundaries, uh, and we'll more to, on that to come. And then next week, the paradox of God's power uh, and how we are made perfect in our weakness, and we are most powerful in our weakness. We're going to talk about Pentecost. That is the coming 
of the Holy Spirit next week. It's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, tune in, show up. Can't wait to see you. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to move forward in worship. And, uh, oh, one other thing. I forgot to say this. I stole a bulletin to make sure I could show you this. On the bottom third of your bulletin, hopefully you got one of these when you came in. I did not. I had to steal this, literally. Um, in the bottom third of this is a Connect card. So if you're brand new here, maybe you're checking things out, please fill one of those out. You can drop it in the offering baskets. Those will be in the lobby on your way out. Um, you can drop it in there. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, if you have questions about our church, if you'd like for us to join you in prayer or pray over you, pray for you, sign off on that. If you're interested in what it means to be baptized or to follow Jesus, we'd love to connect with you on that as well. You can drop that in the offering baskets on the way out. Uh, those of you who call this church your home, uh, those offering baskets are your opportunity to respond to God's generosity in your life as you head out, and uh, you can do that. Those of you who are online, we greet you and welcome you. Uh, you have a Connect card there in the description of your uh, uh, of your bulletin, not bulletin, the description of the video that you're watching, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook. So now I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to, after I'm done praying, you get to greet some people and be nice to them and tell them they're, they're nice and you can act like you're nice too. So God, we're grateful for this day and every day for, uh, Lord, your mercy that is new every morning. Lord, we're thankful that you take us wherever we are and you love us right there, but you're you love us so much that you're not content to leave us there. But rather, you shape and you transform us. You make us into who you want us to be, who you've created us to be. The fullness of who you, even when we were in our mother's womb, you molded and made us to be. So God, it's amazing to consider, even despite our sin and our brokenness, that your love for us still stands and remains strong. Enough so that you would give your son Jesus that he might resurrect our broken and dead lives to new life. And so, Lord, as we come together in this place today, we want to lift up your name. But remind us first once again of your grace. Remind us of your greatness that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. That we might declare to the nations, God, just how good and glorious you really are. We love you. We thank you for loving us first. We confess, Lord, we have messed up many times over, and we're trusting in you and you alone. Our faith is in you, Jesus, and you are all we have, but we are confident, Lord, that you are enough. And so come, Lord Jesus, meet us here, restore us, make us new, use us to declare your glory throughout all the world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, stand up and greet somebody you haven't got to speak with yet. Let them know you're glad to see them this morning. catcher for that too? Do you like to play the catcher? You're good at it. Yeah, I know. As you make your way back to your seat, we'd love for you guys to stay standing and sing along with us.
Thank y'all so much for singing along with us. You can have a seat. And at this time, we want to invite our kids, ages three years old to second grade, to head to Well Junior. You guys will meet your leaders in the back. And then families, you can pick them up in the Well Junior rooms at the end of our service today. Good morning again. All right. Y'all look good. You look good, and uh, you look like I kind of feel. You look ready for summer and ready for all that brings, and uh, I'm feeling that deep within. One announcement I forgot to mention earlier, which is one of my favorite things about summer as of late, is our church league softball. No hollering about a bad call. Uh, yeah, it's very exciting. Uh, Church League softball starts this week. In fact, tomorrow night, the men play, and then on um, Thursday nights uh, is the co-ed team. So we have a men's team and a co-ed team, all right? And uh, anyways, I don't know the exact times for these games. I will tell you, if you uh, tune in to our Facebook page, The Well, um, on Facebook, at The Well Long Beach, at The Well Long Beach, you can find us there. Um, we will post times this afternoon so that you know what time to be there tomorrow to cheer on uh, our softball team. It's a very exciting, and uh, if you've never been to one, you should check it out. It's a lot of fun, and hey, they're actually really good, and it's fun to watch, so uh, don't let me down, by the way, gentlemen. Uh, I'm not on the team, so you got nothing to worry about. Anyways, yeah. Anyways, I love to cheer. It's going to be a good time. Summer's here. It's awesome. We have two weeks, including today, left in our series on paradox. Paradox is a term, a phrase that would tell us that it's a, it's a reality or a truth that uh, upon initial looking uh, is something that seems absurd or just kind of ridiculous, but upon further investigation, it's, it actually comes out to be true. And so uh, we've been looking at this through the lens of spirituality of Christianity uh, in that the kingdom of God, there's a lot of things that to the outside looking in seem to be kind of ridiculous uh, or absurd, but upon further investigation, it, it, it is discovered that these, these, this is actually true and a, and a very real thing. And so, like, for example, last week we talked about generosity, and that it's actually through when we give ourselves away, not just our finances, but to include our finances, when we give ourselves away, we actually receive back uh, a blessing, like we receive from that. And so we discovered sort of the paradox is that it really is, as cliche as it may sound, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And so today's paradox is the idea of boundaries, that actually when we adhere to certain limitations or boundaries, I hate to say rules because that's such a bad word, but reality is uh, God gives us a certain framework, a certain boundary, certain boundaries to live within, and when we do so, we actually discover what real freedom looks like, what true joy can be when we live within the boundaries that God has placed among us as an invitation to not only keep us safe, but to give us real life. And so, if that sort of sets you with a little bit of tension, I hope it does. And honestly, this is one of those sermons that maybe by the end of it, you might feel a little bit offended, and I'm, I'm kind of okay with that. Uh, I hope that you'll be offended by the gospel and not anything that I say, but I hope that when you discover that, and because and, let's be honest, like when I, when I read the Bible, we, we talk about this. This is, this is not in the sermon. This is extra. You get to sort of peek into some of our planning and creating here at the well. One of the things we talk about is the gospel in and of itself, right, is offensive to people, right? To, to, for me, for, for us to understand that we are broken sinners who need the grace of Jesus, right, that, that could be offensive to someone who might actually be a sinner, 
who needs Jesus, right? I mean, I know when I first discovered that reality for myself, it was really not something I wanted to hear. In fact, I kind of pushed back on it for a while, if I'm being honest. And so in, in our designing and creating and dreaming of what it means to do ministry, we hope that if you're offended in any way, that it really is with the gospel and not us. We hope that it's not, you know, bad coffee or rude people, right? We hope that it's the gospel. And so we make no uh, apologies that if the gospel is difficult at times to swallow, we're okay with that, right? Because that is Jesus and his invitation to a new life. Because we believe that when we surrender and submit our lives to Jesus, as difficult as that may be, it really is the place, paradox in and of itself, it is the place where we find real life. And so today, we look at this idea of boundaries. But before we do, like, i got to tell you, um, and, and I, I often uh, throw my kids smooth under the bus when it's time to, uh, to, to, to preach, but they teach me a lot of lessons, and they reveal to me the realities of the gospel at times. And I, I did, I, I was kind of rough on my, my one daughter last, uh, one of my daughters last week uh, when we talked about generosity, but she she, she got her money, and so anyways, it wasn't that big a deal. You can go back and watch last week's sermon if you're curious, but uh, this week, I think it's, it's, it's safer for me to throw the dogs under the bus uh, where they belong, okay? So we have, oh uh, yeah, we have two dogs in our house, uh, two dogs. One, is his name is Amos, uh, full name Amos Moses, and if you have heard that name before, you're good people, right? If you don't know, you should Google it. Jerry Reed, Amos Moses, your day will be blessed. I promise you. It's a song. It's amazing. Anyways, uh, the song says Amos Moses could eat up his weight in groceries. And Amos really could. Like he is a, he is a Louisiana leopard catahoula, at least we think. Um, and so, <laughs> guess we're disclaimer. He was the first dog we got after we uh, said goodbye to Maggie, our first basset hound. And then um, something, I don't know, I had a lapse for a moment, and we wound up getting two dogs because we wanted another, they wanted another basset hound. And so now we have a, a catahoula and we have a basset. And uh, I've talked about the basset before. She's terrible. She's the worst dog of all time. Still is. Uh, it was her birthday yesterday. But Amos really is a good dog, except this one time. Except this one time. In fact, before Brownie entered the picture and further corrupted him, uh, Amos was a pretty much a good dog. But one day, um, there was a knock at the door. I can't remember the exact scenario, but Amos found his way out the front door. And Amos now is probably about this tall. He's got long, slender legs, and the dude, if he wants to, can move. And I mean he can move quickly, right? And so when he got out the front door, he was gone. And when I say gone, I mean like a block down the street in the blink of an eye, and I was like, I don't know what to do. Kind of panicked. Now, side note over here, and I promise we'll go somewhere with this, but um, we have a, there's a neighbor in our neighborhood, uh, is always walking this, I think he's a standard poodle. So pretty tall dog, but a poodle nonetheless. And the dog just kind of hops around. His name's Teddy. Uh, if you are in and around Pecan Park, you might have seen Teddy before. Teddy walks a lot. And uh, Teddy is sometimes on a leash, sometimes he's not. Teddy is very well behaved and very well trained. And uh, Teddy's master said to me, as he saw me frantically chasing my family's dog around the neighborhood, he said, is he, uh, let's see, how do he say it? He said, is, is, is he aggressive? And I was like, I don't know, like he's just a puppy, like we just, we hadn't had him that long, I don't think he is, we got four kids, he's never done anything, he's like, well, do you want me to help you catch him? And I was like, I, I don't know, dude, like he's gone. He's like, no, I can get my dog to go get him. <laughs> well, in that case, I'll do anything, go. And I swear to you, as sure as I'm standing right here, and I wish I knew the guy's name, I've met him, and I think he's probably given me his name before, and I can't remember, but he opened the back gate, to, to the gate to his backyard, and he looked at Teddy, this poodle, and he said to Teddy, he said, work him. And he said that about three times, and as I sure as I'm standing here, Teddy worked him. And within less than 90 seconds, Teddy had Amos sitting in someone's front yard waiting he went over, got him, and he said, you need to bring me a leash because I can't hold him all day. And we brought Amos back home. And I was amazed and astounded. And he told me, he said, if you ever need me to do that again, you know where I live. I was like, good Lord. Now, we grew up, we had, we had some 
cattle dogs that were not trained, but just instinctively they could herd things. And it was a, it's amazing to watch a dog work. But what is more amazing is to see a dog who has everything he could ever dream of at my house. The, he gets fed better than I do at times, right? Just kidding. Y'all know better than that. But <laughs> he has everything he needs. And yet in that moment, all he wanted was what? Freedom, right? He wanted freedom. But all of us sitting in this room know what kind of freedom he was about to be afforded, right? Had he got out into Pineville Road, Lord have mercy, uh, if he'd have gotten over on Beatline, his chances were not great. He was fast, but he ain't fast enough. And what he thought was freedom really was not freedom at all. In fact, his safest place, his best life is going to be lived at 706 Briarwood sitting in the backyard enjoying all the moles and squirrels and birds he can chase, right? His safest place, the place where he will receive the most care and the best protection is within the bounds of a family who <clears throat> most of the time loves him. The thing is, when we look at boundaries, Sometimes we can sort of stand off. We live in a culture, and I don't want to be that guy, but we do. We live in a culture that, that, that celebrates and applauds you can be anything you want to be. You can do anything you want to do. And I don't want to limit this, but what I would, what I would rather us say is you can be exactly who God created you to be. Unfortunately, that limits us, right? Because we can't be anything we want to be but we can be, anything, be exactly what God wants us to be. But with that comes boundaries. With that comes limitations. With that comes shalls and shall nots, right? So boundaries are sometimes difficult to talk about. And, but at the same time, if we're honest, we actually, we actually love limitations. I mean, we love boundaries, right? We like boundaries, right? When you're driving down the road... When you're driving down the road, there's usually a line in the middle, right? It's either dotted, it might be lined and dotted, it might be double lines. Um, and, and, and some people, if I may, just waste a little bit more of your time. Some people could go back and reread, especially what that left lane means on an interstate and how you should treat it, and it's only optional if you're... Anyways, we are grateful. We are grateful when people abide by the boundaries and don't get over in our lane. Am I Right? And we trust people are going to do that, right? Staying in their lane. We, we love boundaries, limitations, rules, regulations. When you go to the restaurant after church today, you're assuming, if not even hoping, that the people who are preparing your food are abiding by some kind of boundaries. They're abiding by some kind of regulation or rules, right? They are washing their hands, please Jesus, before they make your cheeseburger, right? Right? They are keeping that cheeseburger at a certain temperature when it's raw and when it's cooked because it's best for everyone if we live according to the rules. However, when someone puts a boundary up around us and wants to limit us, we at times tend to, and maybe I'm just confessing my own sin before you. It may not be you, but I want to sort of stand off a little bit, right? I want a little bit of special privilege. I want to sort of flex a little bit. And, 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 and I'm, I know y'all would never be guilty of this, but how often have I found myself knowing what the rules are, but assuming they apply to everybody <laughs> except me, right? Just this one time. But really, boundaries are given to us. Rules, regulations are given to us as a gift, and they actually are a means of grace from God. And so we're going to dive in and talk about that a moment. Before we do, I do have to say this. I remember growing up, my parents were a bit, I wouldn't say they were strict, but they were very firm, right? There was a time you went to bed, and it was, when it was time, it was time. There were things you could, so when it's junk food you can eat, and then there was a cutoff. There's sugar, chocolates, candy, like you can have so much, but then that's enough, right? Then my parents got grandkids, and it's like the Outback Steakhouse, right? No rules, just right, right? We know the dangers. We know the dangers 
of just removing all the rules. We, we know the, the dangers of lifting all limitations and all boundaries. You get this sort of chaos. In fact, I would say that the lack of boundaries and rules creates nothing but chaos. We would see that in the world around us if there was no rules and regulations, right? I would say the same is true for us spiritually speaking. But if you take out all the regulations, all the rules that we don't want Christianity to have, we take all that away and we just want to center on grace. And God loves us anyway, no matter what, right? And he does, trust me. I'm living proof. He loves us anyway. But if we stop there, really all we get is chaos, a life that spins out of control, a life that, that receives forgiveness but then never straightens up and walks in the direction that Jesus would lead. You remember the stories of Jesus, right? I mean, he would stand in the gap between sinners and self-righteous leaders and say, let the first one of y'all who is without sin cast the first stone. And yet, at the end of all of that, look at the woman and say, now, when you leave here, go and sin no more. Jesus was the full embodiment of grace and truth. He was the full embodiment of come just as you are, but do not stay that way. In fact, Jesus, in, in Christ, everyone can come just as they are. But no one is allowed to stay as they are. We are all given this invitation, this broad invitation to come to Christ, come to Jesus, and then to yield and surrender to his way of life that we, may, we might be made back into the image that we were created in before sin entered the world. So how did we, why do we even have Rules. I, I believe, number one, that in our world, I just need to say this out loud, like, I believe there is a God-ordained, a, 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 a God-designed order to the world. In fact, without that order, even in the natural world, without that order, the world would spin into chaos. I mean, I, mean, I even, in my brain, and this is a conversation for another day, in my brain, natural disasters are a product of the fall of an of a, of a earth that was created so perfect that there never was natural disaster until sin entered the world and tilted everything off kilter to the point where we experience the product of sin even in the natural level. And so for me, this idea that if we reject the boundaries and the order that God has put in this world, not just in the created order, but in us who are the creator, in our spiritual lives, if we reject that, we will be subject to all kinds of chaos, and our life, too, will spin out of control. And for any of you who might be living in, or most recently have lived in sin, and, and I, I've been there, you know that the world just spins out of control, and we don't know what to do with it. Here's what I would say, is that apart from God's grand design, chaos ensues. Not only in the natural world, but even in the spiritual world. There is a God-ordained order and ethic to life. That outside and apart from, there is only chaos and heartache. And yes, God loves us just, as the, way, just the way we are, but we are invited into much more than forgiveness. We're invited into restoration to be set right, and to be put on a track, to be drawn in and placed in an environment that we were created to live within. It all started at creation. In fact, in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 2, I got a lot of scripture I wish I could. I realized when I worked on this sermon, we have a series here that I'm trying to get a sermon out of. And we'll, we'll, we may revisit some of this. So um, our poor tech, tech crew, which are my, my daughter over there, has got a lot of scripture, and she has no idea where I'm headed. Um, and that's fine. I mean, she's got them in front of her. But in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, let's, let's jump right there. The Lord 
God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed in him the breath of life, and he became a living person, right? Verse 18 tells us that it was the, the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper for him. And so the Lord God formed from the ground all, all the wild animals and birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And he chose a name for each one. He gave them names of the livestock, all the birds of the sky, the wild animals. But still there's no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs, closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, the one, this one is from my, it's bone from my bone, flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. The two are united as one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but neither one of them felt any kind of shame. And then the scene shifts. The scene shifts as the man and the woman are approached. They were given full dominion over this incredible, God had given the dominion to the man, and he now shares it with the woman. He says, you can have anything you want to eat in this entire garden, any of it. In fact, you have complete and supreme reign and rule over all of you. You are now dominion over Take anything you want. You just stay out of this one spot. This is, this is my, this is the, these are the boundaries, right? These are the limitations. You can have all of this. You can't have this. They're convinced by the serpent, the evil one, Satan himself, comes along and says, surely that's not true. Let me just say the first step toward sin is deception, right? I would say this, the first step toward crossing the boundaries that God has given us is somehow either being convinced by someone else or convincing ourselves that that's not exactly what he meant. Even though, if you go back and read, it's actually pretty clear. It's actually pretty clear. And so they eat of the fruit of the tree, of the knowledge of good and evil. And at that, night, at that time, verse 7 of chapter 3 says, at that moment, their eyes were open, and suddenly they felt shame at their nakedness, and they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife were heard, uh, heard the Lord walking around in the garden, and so they hid from him. Let me just say, too, when we find ourselves beyond the boundaries of where God would have us, our natural response, our natural response to God is to sort of deflect, to kind of hide kind of pretend like nothing's going on over here, right? They hid from the Lord among the trees, and the Lord called to them, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. He said, who told you that you were naked? Who told you? And then he asked the question. God says, have you eaten from the tree whose fruit... I commanded you not to eat. And the man replied, it was her, <laughs> right? If you go back and read the story, though, Adam, the man was the one given the command before she ever showed up. And so it was his responsibility to keep himself and her within the bounds. And his first initial reaction is passivity, to say, not my fault. It was her. What does she do? She passes it on and said, it's the snake's fault. At the end of the day, you and I are responsible to respond to God's will and his way in our life. No one else is. I firmly believe in a communal effort in this path we call Christianity, this relationship with God, and I need you desperately to keep me on the path. But at the end of the day, I will answer for me and you will answer for you. And so it all starts here in this garden where, where the safety and the beauty and the, the holiness of Eden was given to the man and the woman, and they chose to just step outside the back door and see what might be over the fence. And it was there that they discovered, in all honesty, death. 
they were living in life as they discovered death. And from that point forward, all the earth, all the creation, all of humanity suffers from that moment of the fall, you and I included. And yet God in his infinite mercy and grace was not done with us in that moment. It would have seemed right or at least understandable for him to wipe his hands and say, uh, as my dad would say, you made your bed, son, now lay down in it. It's yours, right? But God in his mercy began in that moment a plan of redemption. And it actually begins just, just moments, I say moments, it was some time later. It's not too many chapters over, but in Exodus chapter 20, we get the top 10, right? We get the 10 commandments. And, and I think it's easy in our day and time to look at, that, at the 10 commandments as some kind of archaic rules that God put into place and Jesus comes along and just says, I ah, don't worry about those. Just, just, do, just, just hang out with me, you'll be fine. And I'd love to believe that. And I really believe that as I look through that list and realize how short I've come on that list, um, I'm confident that there's enough grace in Jesus to say, just, just come, come with me. But the, the invitation to come with him is not just so we can ignore that, but I will now fit you to a place. I will now work with you. I will put my spirit in you so that not only can I forgive your past sin, but I will set you upright. This is one of my greatest joys of, 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 of reading and understanding a Wesleyan sense of theology a, 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 is, is this idea that uh, we are going on to be made back into the image of Jesus. We are on a path what's called sanctification, that not only are we rescued in a moment where Jesus says, come sit under my wing, but now let me teach you to fly. Let me, let me teach you to walk again so that you might walk in the ways of God. And so when it comes to the Ten Commandments, when it comes to the law, Jesus comes not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law, to affirm all of the boundaries, all of the safeguards that God gave us initially, to shore them up and to enable us to actually live within them. You see, for many years, the people of Israel, the people of God, had attempted to live according to that top ten. In fact, let me read you the covenant. This is actually in chapter 19. This is in chapter 19. In verse 3, I'll pick up and read. Moses climbs up the mountain. He's going to get the, the ten commandments, right? He's going up to appear before God. Then God called to him from the mountain and said, Give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. In other words, go give these to my people. Right? Thank God he pared it down to like 10. Right? He says, You have seen what I did. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. They had just been delivered. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will, listen to this, if you will obey my commandments, if you will obey and keep my covenant, you will be, on, you will be my own special treasure from among the peoples, from among all the people on earth. All the earth belongs to me, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. This is God speaking to Moses saying, tell this to the people. If they will keep this covenant, and the covenant was this, I want you to live within these bounds, and I will help you. I will bless you. I will take care of you. I will deliver you. I will keep you from harm. I will not let anyone get a hold of you. I will be your God, and you will be my people. Live within these bounds, right? And just as a refresher uh, for fun, right? The first one, and you can find these all in chapter 20 and, and elsewhere, but you can find this very, very simply to say, no other gods before me, right? No graven image, no idols, right? Don't make for yourself 
an idol. Do not misuse the name of the Lord. Remember to observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You'll have a long life. Make note of that. You must not murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness or testify falsely against your neighbor. Don't covet your neighbor's house or stuff. Simple things that all of us have fallen short on, and yet they still stand as boundaries. A life that if we adhere to with God's help, we find true freedom, and it's a paradox. It's, a, it's this wild, absurd idea that if we would choose to surrender and limit ourselves to the ways of God, we would actually flourish and grow and enjoy life. It's not lost on me that I'm comparing us all to my wife's dog, uh, and I apologize for that, but they actually have taught me a lot. There is safety and there's joy, and there's providence, and there's all of these things within the bounds of a loving master, of a loving God, of a loving father, who wants nothing but to give good gifts, and to give joy, and to give restoration, and to give purpose, and to give meaning. And yet he invites us to choose to limit ourselves and surrender to his ways. Sometimes that's hard for us to do. Our natural tendency is to rebel. Our natural tendency is to see what's in that tree over there because I know these all look really good, but what if there's something better over there? What if there's something more exciting on the other side? I not only think about this in terms of sort of boundaries, fence, if you will, But Jesus himself, when he shows up, and it wasn't even his idea, long before Jesus showed up, you had folks like David giving us the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. We can sort of look through it through the lens of a sheep, of sheep. A shepherd was given as caretaker of sheep. In fact, in John chapter 10, and I wish I could read through all of this, but I trust you'll go home and read John chapter 10. All through there, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And then he talks all about what a good shepherd does, right? He lays his life down for his sheep. In other words, he will stand in the gap and protect his sheep, right? But there's an understanding that the sheep are submitted to and surrendered to the work of the shepherd. In fact, it's David in Psalm 23 that says, your rod and your staff, they do what? They comfort. Some translations will say they comfort and protect me. And even when I walk through the darkest valley, I'm not alone. You're with me. And you're guiding me. And you're protecting me. Was the valley of the shadow of death was a very dangerous place. Not just allegorical. It was a dangerous place to be. And sheep needed a shepherd in that moment. And the shepherd always did what was right. In fact, Jesus says uh, elsewhere in John chapter 10, I'm the gate. In other words, I'm a shepherd who will lay down literally and become the the ceiling point of the boundary. There's a a built boundary, and the sheep would come in and go out of the gate, and Jesus says, I put myself right there. I let in, I let out, I protect, I keep all harm outside. So living within the boundaries that God has given us really is the place where we discover safety and hope. It's the place where we discover meaning and purpose. One of my all-time favorite passages, Luke chapter 15. Love it for the prodigal son, but I also like finding lost coins, and I like learning about lost sheep. And I hear people quote this all the time. Doesn't he leave the 99 to go find the one? He 100% does. See, 100%, one out of, anyways. Sorry, I'm trying. He leaves the 99 to go find the one. But what does he do with the one? It doesn't really say. He brings him back. They throw a party, right? He puts him back in the pen. He puts him back in the fold, if you will. In other words, the sheep who wanders out of the safety, out of the boundaries that have been given to him for his good, 
The shepherd will go and rescue and bring him back. But the next step is not just to bring him back, lest he turn right around and go right back out. The goal is to get the sheep home and to get the sheep back into safety, the safety of the boundaries, who many other sheep would look at and say, didn't you like it when you left and ran out there? My guess is the sheep would say, no, it was terrible. Nobody protected me. Nobody fed me. I was so happy when my shepherd found me. I don't know what the sheep would have said. I know if you keep reading that passage, you wind up on the prodigal son, and essentially it's all the same story, just told in different, it's, they're parables, right? And so, so when Jesus tells us the story of the prodigal son, what happens to the prodigal son? He wandered out the gate. The shepherd let him go, and he went off, and he found freedom. And what did the freedom grant him but heartache and chaos? and destitution. And what does he do when he comes back? He says, I am so sorry. At least in your home. At least within the safety of the bounds of my father's house. Don't miss this. I find at least three squares, right? That's what he said to himself. At least I can get three square meals. I'll just go to work for him. If I can just get back in the boundary. But y'all know what the father does, right? Y'all know what he does. He throws a party. And he restores the son to sonship. He restores the son. He says, you're not going to work for me. You're my son, and you're going to be my son. And that is the beauty of submitting and surrendering to the boundaries that God has placed on us. So as we close out here, I want to just invite you to consider this. What are the boundaries that God has put in your life? Now, I'm not going to say everybody's got different ones because I think the Bible's very clear on the boundaries. You've got the Ten Commandments. You've got the, the, the shoring up and the affirmations that Jesus offers toward that. He gives very clear commands. Jesus does. But going back to something I mentioned, order, I, I mentioned earlier, I believe there is a God-ordained order. There's a, there's a God-designed order to all of life, not just the natural world, but in our relationships, there's a God-designed order. Some of us are not living within that. And I believe God desires for us to live holy and fully within this God-designed order, this God-designed boundary. There's some shalls and shall nots when it comes to relationships that the Bible is incredibly clear on. When it comes to how you treat your neighbor, there's some very clear boundaries some very clear shalls and shall nots of how we ought to treat our neighbor. And no one, no, again, we don't get to decide, well, that rule is for everyone else, but it's a little different for me, right? No, your neighbor's your neighbor, and you got to treat them like that. When it comes to the way we handle our finances, there's some very clear boundaries around how, what we should do with our money. And again, living within those boundaries brings blessings, bring, brings providence, brings every good thing that God wants to give to you. But if you step out of that, if you ignore those boundaries and you wander off, you can only expect chaos and heartache, brokenness, frustration, anxiety, all of the things that come with that. I believe that there is a God-designed ethic to life and how we treat people, how we interact, not just with God, but with other people. In fact, if you look at the top 10, there's more of them in there of how we treat other people than actually how we talk to God. The two are inseparable. And so I invite you, as unpopular, as unnatural as it may be, to search the word of God, the truth about who God is, and ask him, am I living within the circle? Am I living within the bounds of your great will for my life? Am I doing what you'd have me do? Am I acting like you would have me act? Am I loving how you would have me love? Am I serving how you would have me serve? Am I, am I treating, am I, am I getting this? If not, where am I missing it? I'm confident if you will pray that prayer earnestly, if you will search the scriptures with no shaded lens, but just ask God to speak to you through the word that his Holy Spirit would guide you, I believe you will discover very quickly the things in your life and in my life that really, we're in left field. God's like, come, 
Come home. It's better over here anyway. Come back. It's safer over here. There is, there is joy to be found within the limitations and the boundaries that God offers to us. And that, my friends, is a paradox. Because on the surface, your neighbors and your friends, maybe even some of your family, is going to look at you and like, you're an idiot. This doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? You ought to do what feels right. You ought to, you, you, you ought to believe what seems reasonable. The Bible's archaic. It doesn't mean much. I'm here to say, I believe within the bounds of my genuine fake leather here are the words and the truth of life. That, 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 this, that this, this, this Bible here calls me to say no to things and to say yes to things with God's help so that I might not just receive his forgiveness, but I might be able to live the full story. And that is a broken child of God received by forgiveness and restored and healed to walk in the wholeness and the newness of life. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May God walk with you this day and every day, keeping you safe within his bounds and giving you a life that you never thought you could receive. May God bless you and keep you. We will see you back here next week. Amen.